We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have with me. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this one. Free out of mind. This is just a ride. ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love, love. love. Corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish side of the moon. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Irish Side of the Moon. My name is Shane Harrison and I'll be your host for this week's show. I would encourage you to check us out online at irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com There you'll find a back catalogue of all our shows. Also, if you happen to be on Facebook, like us at facebook.com forward slash irishsideofthemoon. There you can comment on previous shows, you can suggest topics or guests for future shows get your friends and family if you're on Facebook to, to, to like us as well now I'm delighted to welcome Paul Grignon to this week's show Paul hails from Toronto Canada and is an artist and documentary maker Paul's early years were mostly taken up with his passion for painting in 1973 while taking the summer off to go hiking around the Rockies he met his partner and they ended up in a place called Gabriola where he is still based to this day in some ways, his early days in Gabriola, leading what he described himself as the happy lifestyle, gave Paul a true appreciation for nature and community, and how through cooperation and fairness, the rewards are far greater than through competition. Paul is probably most well known for his Money as Debt trilogy of films, which he wrote, produced and directed, and that deals with what both he and many others around the world believe is the true root cause of the boom-bust cycles namely the money system itself. But Paul is not one for sitting on his laurels, and with the final instalment of Money is Debt, he puts forward what he believes to be a viable alternative. I would encourage everybody to check out Paul's websites, namely www.moneyasdebt.net That's moneyasdebt.net and also www.digitalcoin.info That's digitalcoin.info Paul, you're very welcome to the Irish side of the moon. And how are you today, sir? Oh, I'm fine, thanks, Shane. Okay, Paul, I was thinking probably the best way to, to do this interview is, first of all, we'll break it into to two parts. Maybe we'll start off with the first part. We'll cover how the current system works and the many misconceptions that both, I suppose, the majority of the population believe to be true. And I would also include in that politicians and even people who are working within the financial system itself. And then in the second half of the show, we'll cover the solution that you put forward in Money as Debt 3. Uh, but before we get into all of that, I would first like to spend a few minutes talking about your own life before getting involved in the Money as Debt series. So I suppose a good place to start off would be uh, telling us a bit about yourself and your time growing up in Toronto, in Toronto sorry, and then what led you to go on to, I believe, is it Gabriel? Am I pr- pronouncing that right? People Ga- pronounce it both ways, so... I don't Gabriel know if there's a right way or a wrong way. I, I say <laughs> Gabriola. Okay, Gabriola. Um, I suppose, yeah, what, what led you to Gabriola and why, I suppose, why you fell in love with the place and what eventually led you on the path that you're on today? Well, Gabriola is a beautiful island, and if you go to my art website, paulgrignon.com uh, or uh, moonfirestudio.ca, and then you'll see why I... I like living here. I've lived here for thirty, almost thirty-eight years now. Okay. And how did you find? How did you come? Up, how did you come? Oh, right. up, come how did we get here? Oh, really by oh. accident. Okay. Well, I, I had lived. I spent a summer hiking in the Rocky Mountains, and then we. I had no money, and we arrived with the, just the clothes on our back, and we were planning to camp all winter. And basically, we camped for four years. <laughs> <laughs> There was no building code, so I was able to start a house and live in it while I was constructing it. So I built my own house without any getting into debt. That was one of my one of my big priorities, and I figured out in high school that I didn't figure it out really. I, I just suspected. I had a sneaking suspicion that the banking system was based on perpetual growth of money because of the interest, and that uh, debt was a trap. 
Okay, and do you still live in that this house today? I do. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, and you're already, you're also spending a certain amount of time in, in Toronto to start off with. Um, I suppose life in the big cities completely different to where you eventually ended up. The contrast would be, I suppose, vast between living in a big metropolis like Toronto and then moving somewhere as isolated as an island. Uh, yeah, it certainly was. I, I never really liked Toronto all that much. I lived in Ottawa as well for in my high school years, and that was a much smaller city. I and mean, you could you could get out of it. Toronto, you can't get out of. You know, you got to drive for an hour just to get out of the city. I suppose from an from an artistic point of view, it's very hard to be in, inspired in. I suppose a uh, um, a jungle made of stone and iron and stuff like that. As well, I mean, it depends what you want to paint. <laughs> sure, yes. an urban type artist is full of inspiration, but it wasn't inspiring to me and what type what type of art what do you like to paint what kind of art yeah oh i do uh what you might call magic realism you're um, gonna have to explain that in landscapes or i call them beatscapes since i live on an island and there's always you know you can't drive more than half an hour without finding coming to a beach <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like a real paradise oh uh, yeah it's the um, the most temperate place in canada uh, the actual place identified as the most temperate place in Canada is right where we live. Wow, you really got a jam there, well. Yeah, well, <laughs> this summer, it's, it's cold and gloomy. It's not, we, We've only had like three days of summer this year. It's temperate, all right. Well, with that point, you, know, you, you could be in Ireland as well without the beaches. Yeah, it's such a beautiful place. I mean, it's, it's got so many different beaches and some big trees. Okay, well, I suppose... Oh, it's the lore of the west coast of Canada, yeah. Yeah. I suppose moving on to, to, to why we brought you on to the show t to discuss the money system, and you kind of alluded there um, when you built your own house. What first made you begin to question um, the money system that's in place today? Oh, gee, back in high school when we took exponential functions, and we took... When we took exponential functions, and I realized that, hey, this is going to hit the wall in my lifetime, both the money system and population growth. Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose both of them's grown exponentially at the moment, and once you had to, once I say once you get beyond the curve, like there's just no turning back. Yes, and exponential growth is like uh, you know every time something doubles and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets bigger off fast or you beat doubling. So people just don't seem to comprehend, don't seem to be able to comp comprehend the ultimate effect of exponential growth. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, when you begin, to, and there's, I suppose there's so many examples of what you can give. I think I've seen a documentary or a video online one time describing, I think it was like the giant stadium in New York, and if you had a drop of waterfall on your finger and it just kept doubling, that how long would it take for the stadium to fall? And it was something like, I think it was 47 minutes. But in terms of it being up to as far as your ankle, it took maybe 40 minutes. So within the last seven minutes, uh, it was just unbelievable the rate at which it would increase. So I suppose that's what we're experiencing at the moment with both the money system population and I suppose the impact on the planet in, in, in terms of natural resources as well. Yeah. We're like, we don't seem to be any smarter than the bacteria in a bottle of wine. The bacteria multiply until they either run out of food or they pollute themselves to death. I think right? it was as the bacteria's uh, excretions and they die of their own pollution. I think there was an experiment done in, in the 50s or the 60s where um, they put ra rats into a confined space and um, they only give a certain amount of resources and once and I, they were constantly reproducing and once they run out of resources then they start to, I suppose, eat themselves and eventually come as natural at extinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been familiar with both that study and the one you talked about the about the stadium. Yeah, the stadium's only half full on the last on the second last day, or second last uh, doubling, and then on the last doubling, it's completely full. Yeah, I think to give the example, if if you were um, if you were handcuffed to the top row of the seats to 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 the barrier, how long how long do you think you would take to be able to get free? And again, it just brought home like within the last number of minutes that. It would just be go over like that there in the blink of an eye. Um, before we go on to, I suppose, the money system itself, um, 
I want to break down how the current system works, and I've done this before, I suppose, with some of the other guests, but I do feel it's important to try to get the information out there. There's a lot of misconceptions about how things actually really work. Um, so I suppose a good place to start off with would be when we talk about our money in the bank, it's, it's not quite the case. Or when we talk about getting a loan or borrowing from the bank, again, or lending from the bank's perspective, what suggests that we are getting something that they already have, or not only do they already have, um, but is actually in existence as well. But something that the bank, um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of terminologies out there that we associate in, in day-to-day use, which is not the case at all. Could you explain what you found um, and why it's not the case? Well, the situation with bank credit, bank credit is a promise to pay you legal tender on demand. And legal tender is the paper cash that many people think the government produces. But in general, most countries have a central bank, and the central bank produces paper cash to buy taxpayer debt from the government. So the government sells bonds to the central bank, and, well, the government sells bonds to anybody who wants to buy them. But when the central bank wants to add new cash to the system, new legal tender, then it buys the taxpayer debt, and it just prints the cash, or alternatively, the cash can also be a credit at the central bank. You have to understand that the commercial banks that belong to the system, they keep accounts at the central bank. You, you and I cannot, but the banks can. And so an account at the central bank, a credit there, is a credit for cash if you need cash. So there's both, um, the base money in a system is both the bank's credit at the central bank and the actual physical cash that has been printed. And in that, people tend to think of that as real money, but remember that this cash is created to buy taxpayer debt. So even the cash is debt, okay? Yes. Now, you go on to the next stage, and when you go to the bank, you have a bank account at the bank. Now, that bank account isn't a little box in the bank that's full of cash unless you have a deposit box. If you rent a deposit box and you put cash in it, then that cash is yours and you're just renting space in the bank. But otherwise, an account at a bank is what the bank owes you in legal tender if you ask for it. But most of us don't ask for it because uh, we use all kinds of other means. We just switch numbers between bank accounts. We don't actually use cash. Now, people tend to think that their bank account represents cash, but it is a debt of the bank to you. Now, so, if, if you take a loan from a bank, you give the bank a promise. Now, I'll, I'll use dollars, so you, or you can use whatever. But if you go to the bank and you promise the bank $100,000 plus interest over time, the bank balances your promise by giving you a promise of $100,000 on demand. And that promise is your bank account. The bank doesn't need any money to do that, right, as long as you don't ask for cash. And what people do is that you'll borrow money from the bank. The bank simply types in the amount that you've borrowed, and then you go and spend it, and somebody else will deposit it back at a bank. Now, we could imagine that you deposit it back at the same bank, okay? So if you deposit your – if you, say, borrow $10,000 – this is in my movie – borrow $10,000 to buy a used car – pay the person who's selling you the car and they deposit the ten thousand dollars into their account at the same bank the bank just moves the promise from your account to their account the bank yes. doesn't need any money to do that and i guess can? yeah i do and i guess so in the what? banking system there's more than one bank so in actual fact if you borrow ten thousand dollars from one bank and it gets deposited at a different bank then your bank owes that other bank ten thousand dollars but probably that other bank created ten thousand dollars and it was deposited at your bank. So the debts wipe each other out. So if it all worked out perfectly evenly like that, it would be as if there was only one bank. And it's a huge motivation for there to be only one bank. If it's only one world bank, then everybody would have their account at the same bank and the bank would never need any money. Yes. And it could never go broke. But currently in our competitive banking system, some banks get more deposits than, than they do give out loans and others you know, so they end up owing, one bank will end up owing other banks money, and in the end, if they don't correct that imbalance, they will end up being owned by another bank, right? They'll bust, and then some other, the other bank will buy them out. Yes, 
I suppose in, in some ways it is more or less a global system because it's a closed system as you describe yourself. You have a central bank or central banks and all the other banks is connected within the loop anyway. So in essence it really is almost a singular system within each country anyway. Say for example with us within the Eurozone you have the ECB, the European Central Bank. Um, you know, well you're dealing I suppose countries within the actual euro currency itself, like you've you've likes of the UK with their own currency, so they're not within the euro zone per se like that, but they're part of the EU. But like if you go to France or Spain, um, that's pretty much a closed system because ultimately they're dealing with the central bank of their con- country, which is part of the European Central Bank. Well, in the case of the euro, each country has given up its ability to uh, manage its own currency. Yeah. I mean, without managing your own currency, you don't have any sovereignty. Yeah, that's a big gripe of mine because with... Um, with our crisis happened in the last couple of years and what happened there before Christmas time when we had the ECB and we had the IMF and we had the EU coming in to bail us out, the whole argument was we're losing sovereignty now. But I suppose my take on it, my opinion... Well, it was the whole crisis is designed to take your sovereignty. That's how I see it. This is all a process that's been planned for a very long time. And the, and the goal is one world bank so that no, nobody can ever... That bank can never go broke. And everybody will be in debt to it from birth till death. Yes. But I suppose the point I was going to make as well is regarding sovereignty. The fact that a country can't control its own finances anyway would suggest that, I mean, for example, like with Ireland, we, we go on to the bond market and we have to borrow money. So we're not masters of our own finance to start with. So we've already given up sovereignty anyway. It was, I suppose the point I'm making, it, it was a... It was a stupid argument to come up with, or it's stupid to think that um, we've lo- oh, we've only lost our sovereignty now within the last, say, six or nine months. We've lost it for decades. So, yes, you kind of lose it as soon as you adopt the central bank system, because the central bank becomes more important than the government. And you already know the government doesn't respond to the people very much, and then when they're under the thumb of the central bankers, well, they're not going to respond to the people at all. They don't have any choice. You know, they're They're strung out on the on the money supply. And, I mean, governments should be able to just create money. They should just be able to create it and spend it and then collect it back in taxes. Yeah. And uh, there's no, no need to borrow it from anybody. Exactly. Um, no, I, I suppose one of the things that the Money is Debt series of videos, especially one and two, highlights beautifully how we, tra- how, how we transcended, I suppose, from the earlier money systems and into the, the time of the goldsmith and into what we currently have today, which is probably loosely based on the model adopted during the, the time of the Colts, or, or sorry, during the time of the Goldsmith? Well, yes, we, we adopted this model in which money is a commodity in itself. And that is, to me, the fundamental problem. Agreed. Because if money is a commodity in itself, then your ability to pay your loan back depends on whether the money as a commodity is sufficient to pay your loans back. And in my movies, I attempt to prove mathematically that the money to pay your loans back is never sufficient because yes. it gets loaned again. If money is created as a loan once, then to complete the cycle, it has to be available to the borrower to earn in order to pay it the debt back and extinguish the debt. Well, if the money that's created as one debt ends up being loaned again and again and again ad infinitum, it's never available to the borrower to earn. Yes, which and that's makes not it. even considering interest. Interest adds on to this problem. But if all money is what I call twice lent, and it is twice lent. I mean, as soon as you create it as a loan and then it's deposited back into a bank, it's been lent twice. Yep. Let alone going to And to... unless a depositor takes it out, spends it so the borrower can earn it and pay it back, you're never going to extinguish the debt. And the way this works out is that if all money has been lent twice, which is my theory based on the statistics I've studied, then the amount, the total amount of debt can never decrease without causing mathematically inevitable defaults. Yes. And so to me, that's what's not fair, right? If you, if you lose your house and lose your collateral due to some mathematical defect of the system that made it inevitable, then this is a bad system. Uh, uh, absolutely. And I suppose that's that's not even touching, Paul, on, on secondary or third lenders, the likes of credit unions or the likes of you know private finance companies for maybe cars and, and stuff like that there. Obviously, the money they're getting, they have the ability to, to create the credit themselves. Well, some do. No, but chartered banks create credit themselves, and then there are other lenders 
who simply lend out the money that already exists. I mean, I have a local billionaire, and I sat at his computer and looked at all the mortgages he owns, and he he, he doesn't create money. He simply lends what he already has, right? Yes. And he's lending it in order to make more. He keeps rolling over the principal he has. He rolls it over to make it bigger. I mean, he, he's very forthright. He wants to be a billionaire, and this is what he's doing. And uh, so that money is never available debt-free to be earned and used to extinguish the debt that created that money. Okay, yep. I want and to... Uh, that, that's the fundamental thing we overlook. Economists don't study this. I, I look everywhere. I've spent 12 years studying this subject. I found no mention of twice lent money anywhere. And yet it's the most basic thing in the system. You create money as the debt, and then you deposit it back into the bank. Now it's twice lent. As long as it remains twice lent, that original debt can never be paid off. Yeah, it makes an impossible holiday. Um, I want to briefly look at some of the alternatives to our current fiat money system. And before we get into to what you propose in money as debt three, so I want to start off first with looking at, at gold. Now, within the monetary reform movement, and indeed even within the financial system in general, there's a strong lobby for them to bring back gold, to bring back a gold standard. I see it's often argued that this is real money, and some proponents of gold reckon that the, the boom bust cycles have increased dramatically since Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in the early 70s. But you don't share this opinion. Can you explain why? Um, because you're hostage to a metal. Why would you want to make yourself hostage to the supply of a metal? Now, I, yes, certainly gold, gold disciplined the creation of money. Because, but then it also created it. Gold, gold was also the reason we got the system we have now. Yes. See, the, the whole idea is that nobody needs gold. So therefore you have a gold standard or a gold system. But unless it's done the way the bills of exchange system is done in the past, which is much like the proposal I'm making in Money is Debt 3. It's basically the old bills of exchange system that worked for three, 400 years from the early Renaissance until um, roughly 1909. Um, th this was based on gold, but gold is actually only a measure measurement unit of value. People's bills of exchange were always promises of real goods and services. I would promise you so much wool or so much leather or so much oil or so much whatever and that promise would be valued in its gold equivalent but that was because people fought in gold and people people fought in gold pieces they fought in silver pieces or they fought in gold pieces as units of value but we don't do that anymore we only think in terms of national currencies now and so the whole rationale of going back to gold doesn't make much sense and in fact, would just make us hostage to whoever owns the gold in the world. And if you look, there's no natural distribution of gold anymore. No, if you actually look into who holds the gold, next to a couple of countries like the U.S. and Germany, a lot of it's owned by banks. And then the, the gold in the U.S. is probably not gold. It's probably tungsten coated in gold. Yes. And the yes. other thing is, you know, there's. It's now been revealed that a lot of these gold bars that are supposedly worth some whatever a gold bar is worth are actually tungsten, which is worth, what, 1% of what gold is worth. Pennies on the dollar. <laughs> yeah, so there's no, I mean, there's, gold can be fake. Tungsten is exactly the same density as gold. You can't tell whether a gold bar is tungsten or not without drilling a hole in it. Yes. I suppose what you're getting at really is that money went along an evolutionary process and at the early days gold served its purpose it'd be like going back to it'd be like taking the transport system back to before cars or before planes uh at its time the way we traveled with say horse-drawn carts etc boats it was the best mode of transport we had for that period of time but today to go back to that and go back to gold is almost doing the same thing yeah that's i i sort of see it as regressive however i mean I, <laughs> I I don't discourage people from buying gold or silver to protect their wealth because uh, you know, you know they, they do hold their value, but the value of these things as monetary substances is artificial. The value of silver as an industrial metal is not artificial, and therefore uh, in the value of silver, silver is a very good investment. However, I would hate to see the money go back to that. Money probably originated, as if we looked at the original um, forms of money, they were generally promises of wheat from the granary. 
the temple priests would build a granary and everybody would store their grain in the one big secure granary because all the grain is more or less equivalent, so you don't need your grain back. Anybody's equivalent grain is the same. So you get promises of grain from the granary, and those were used as money. And that, that goes back to Babylon. I mean, that goes back thousands of years. That goes back before gold and silver coins. Yes. The thing is you have to be close to the granary to collect on it, right? Yes. So when, they, when we got international trade where people in those days couldn't collect on a promise of actual goods and services from somebody a thousand miles away, then we used gold and silver to do international trade because they didn't require redemption in goods and services. They were payment in themselves. And really, there's really nothing better than gold and silver if you're actually going to use the gold and silver. But as soon as you say started using gold and nobody actually needed gold, then nobody ever looked in the vault to see how much gold there actually was, which allowed the goldsmith to produce all these promises of gold that he didn't have and then collect interest on it. And that system got so well established because it certainly facilitated the commercial expansion of Europe. It was basically one of the reasons why Europe conquered the world, because they were able to finance things with, with promises from the future, use that money to, go, to equip their ships to go out all over the world and take resources from other places, and then come home with it and, and pay off their, uh, their debt with the actual product. You see, so the gold wasn't ever needed. It, it, the actual gold isn't actually needed. What is needed is a value unit with which to measure real things. Yes. And gold was that for centuries, and silver also. Things were measured in those two things. And, but they aren't anymore. People only think in terms of national currencies these days, which is why my solution is basically uh, centers around using national currencies to create a new value unit, one that isn't tied to gold and silver. Yeah, I, th I think you made a, a good point too. I mean, silver, obviously, from an industrial point of view, and gold, even to a degree as well, there is a value in it, especially with modern electronics. But I think it was um, Edison said too, I mean, even the value of gold, even as a store of value, it's fictitious to a degree that human beings somewhere on the planet, and again, it's, it's a limited amount of human beings come up with the actual value for gold as well. Well, when gold goes to $1,600 an ounce, it isn't because people are making more jewelry. Yes. That, that, so, says, that says it all. But silver could go to a tremendous price, and it is because people are making computers and iPods and all these things that require silver. Yes. Then the stupid thing is if people start collecting, hoarding silver for monetary purposes, it makes all of the industrial use of silver more expensive. It doesn't yeah. make any sense, does I, it? It does make any sense at all, no. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, especially when money, what do you want? You really want gold or silver? What use is it to you? You want clothing, you want food, you want shelter, you want services, you want entertainment. Why wouldn't the promise of what you really want serve better as money than the promise of some, uh, some substance that's just being artificially used as money? Because in the past, that was the only technology we, we had to do this with. But we're not limited by technology anymore. We can easily deliver goods worldwide, and we can easily have a, an exchange of promises system that's worldwide. Yes. And these would be the promises of real things. Absolutely. Well, I guess th th that's looking at the gold part. The other, um, the other main alternative put forward today, and I suppose I want to start off by reading you a quote that I know you're more than familiar with from Lincoln, and that is, the privilege of creating an issue in money is not only the supreme prerogative of government, but it is government's greatest, greatest creative opportunity, end quote. Now, this is again fiat currency, but in this case, it's issued by government as opposed to by the private banking cartel. This quote, I suppose, resonates with me on one level, that it shows government working for the betterment of the people. And I know in your own self-issued credit system that thus does happen to a degree and we will talk about that later on in the show but sticking with the government spending money debt-free into existence which I believe you used to support why do you not believe or why do you believe that this is also a limited system? Well for one thing government doesn't produce anything so if government issues money what's the money worth? You see if I, if I issue a uh, uh, Credit for a loaf of bread. I don't. Have you seen it, the essence of money? 
the yes, uh-huh. yeah, you saw that. Okay, that's a that little seven-minute introduction on my Money Is Debt Three DVD, and it's also on the Digital Coin website. That that's under eight minutes gives you the whole idea that if I issue a a, a credit certificate for a loaf of bread, you know what the value of it is. It's worth a loaf of bread. But if the government issues a credit certificate against taxes, you have no idea what it's worth because you don't get an itemized list of what you got for your taxes. Yes. So that that's one of the reasons why government-only issued money doesn't make a lot of sense to me. However, government is definitely included in my, my uh, proposed solution as one of the largest issuers of credit uh, because government certainly should have the right to just spend money into existence and collect it back in taxes. Yes. Because And people go on about, oh, government money is worthless. They, they produce this money and you get nothing for it. Well, my God, you get government. You get roads. You get hospitals. You get bridges. You get, you know, you get everything that, that makes life possible from, from uh, government things. This, this whole idea that government doesn't give you anything in exchange for their money is nonsense. What they do is they abuse this privilege and then they turned it over and then they borrow money from banks at interest when they could just be creating it interest-free for themselves. It's insane. We don't need, I mean, you've got Guernsey over there as an example that did it for, has been doing it for hundreds of years. Canada's most prosperous period was from 1938 to 1976. And during that time, we used the Bank of Canada to finance our government at, and the government got all of its, I mean, the, the system works the same. You pay interest to the central bank, but the central bank then just deducts its cost of, of operation and gives all the profit to the government. So the government just collects taxes, takes a bit out to pay the central bank, and gets to keep the rest. Yes. And Canada's uh, national debt was a tiny, tiny amount. And then in 1976, we started borrowing from private bankers, and the debt, the debt uh, line on the graph just goes up and up and up and up and up. So it's absolutely senseless to be doing that. I, I know you had positive money, Ben Dyson on and. I mean, and the American Monetary Institute. They, the, the only place I disagree with these people is that they want the government to have a monopoly on creating money. And for two reasons, I don't think that's a good idea. One is that government, government money isn't calibrated by any real value, like it would be if you had um, privately issued money against actual products or goods and services. And the other is that government has apparently no um, competence. Yes. It seems like the people who know the least about money get elected. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think what they're, what positive money is also proposing to, and it's almost like the central bank system and what you have in the UK. The, the UK, the Bank of England used to be privately owned, and then it was governmentally owned, and now it's kind of in between in the sense that it's owned by the government, but the government have no say in how the monetary policy is actually it's independent. So that's part of what they're proposing. What they're really proposing, I think it came from, is it Irving Fisher, and instead of having fractional reserve, have a full reserve bank. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's a problem with that. If you've got a full reserve, then what are you lending? Um, I, I, he, he does. There's a fundamental contradiction that the full reserve is that banks wouldn't be banks. I mean, a bank account is always what the bank owes you. Uh, yes. And in a sense, how much sense does it make? I mean, the government just would create more cash right now. Right now, the uh, the system works backwards from what most people think. Is that the 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 banks actually create credit, and then if there's a need for more cash, the central bank provides more cash. It's not the other way around. The banks aren't limited by what cash exists. The cash responds to the need of the banks for cash. Well, I think one other thing with positive money, I suppose I don't get too caught up on, on what what Ben and them's proposing is. Um, because I really want to explore what, what, what you're proposing as well, is that um, savings is, is, is safe. Savings can't be used for, or else you give your permission beforehand. Savings can't be used to fund mortgages and fund you know, speculation on derivative markets and future tradings and stuff like that there. He did actually explain it in, quite, in, in, in a lot of detail when we'd done an interview with him there around Christmas time. Um, and... In some ways, it, it does seem, I suppose, plausible that the way they describe it, and they did actually make a proposal. He was part of the, the joint proposal put forward to the, the banking, the Independent Banking Commission in the UK. So as far as I know, they haven't actually decided yet, but they've made some comments public in the, in the not-too-distant past, and I think the, the comments is kind of hinting that it's going to be 
pretty much more of the same system that they have in that they're not going to move that radically on, on changing the way things are done at the moment. Um, I guess, I guess, Paul, the big attraction and what, where some people see it as a panacea, having government only issued money, is if you look at what's going on in the US at the moment, this whole debacle about the debt ceiling and that America, you know, apparently the, the, the richest and the most sophisticated and the most technologically advanced economy in the world is $14.3 trillion. And debt, as we speak, they're they're spending a million plus dollars a day, or sorry, a billion plus dollars a day on the interest alone. And when people see that there, they kind of think, well, that just doesn't make sense. And they don't see the bigger picture. What you're suggesting, in the sense that, well, how does government, um, how can government gauge progressive? productivity within the economy itself for example if I'm baking bread I know roughly how many loaves I'm going to sell a day, sell a week, sell a month etc etc and that's your sufficient credit for that uh, yeah exactly plus your your credit is calibrated by your prices Yes, and that's, that's the important part and government services are never calibrated by prices so if you were going to have a system in which credit is actually credit against real things, then it can't be limited to government. Yes. Unless you go back to gold or silver, and then you've got back, then you're back to being hostage to the supply of a metal. And I don't think that that's a good idea. I think at the point where we are technologically that we can turn out a very good global liberated money system based on promises of actual things from the people who produce them. Yep. Let's cut out the middlemen and the parasites. Absolutely. <laughs> You know the other strange thing too, I often think, it's a strong case put forward that we can't trust politicians any more than we can trust bankers when it comes to issuing our money. But I'm amazed Well, they've that been um, uh, 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 Chinese twins for, at least since, uh, what, 16, when was the Bank of England? Uh, 1694. Yes. You know, they've been in partnership. Governments benefit from the, the, the banking system because that way they get to uh, spend money and let inflation tax the people rather than tax them directly. And then people don't really see it as a tax. They don't realize that inflation is another form of tax. The government has spent this new money at full value, and then after it circulates, it causes inflation so that you get to spend it at a reduced value. And that difference is taxation. Yes, it's often called Invisible tax. taxation. Yeah. But the other thing, too, I mean, if, if you take that, that we can't trust the politicians... I'm amazed that we don't very damn an indictment in itself. And if you follow the natural consequences of that through, surely if politicians are, or our political system cannot be trusted with the nation's money supply, then how can they be trusted with legislation, legislating a nation's law with equalities? I mean, the trust we are given here is, to a certain degree, we give up certain liberties and natural freedoms to a system that will in turn then do its best for the people. And that is no different in making laws than it is in issuing a nation's credit. I guess the point I'm making is that uh, people are so conditioned to think certain ways that they make statements without realizing the implications of what they're truly saying, i.e. if the political system is not fit to control our credit, then how the hell is it fit to govern us? Have you any thoughts on, on that? Yes, we're also technologically capable of moving to much more participatory democracy than we're being allowed. Okay. And I don't think that there's any way around it. We we have, you know, we're currently being robbed of 700 years of human rights that we were hot, hard fought and people died for. And, you know, many of them were just stolen from us right after 9-11. Patriot Act in the United States. All of this stuff was written before 9-11. So, you know, to think that 9-11 was the reason for this is absolute rubbish. This is all a, a long-term process of taking back all of the human rights that, that were bought, fought for since ever since the Magna Carta. And when people just give them up. Join Facebook where it says, where the contract says that you give permission to Facebook to collect the information on you from any source. Yes. No, nobody even reads the contract. No, no one actually does. That's a very good no, point. No, you just gave the, the intelligence agencies permission to spy on you and gather information on you from any source. Their list includes publications, periodicals, blah, 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 blah. But it didn't exclude anything. It didn't exclude wiretapping or any other source, right? Yep. I mean, all of this stuff, it, it's, it's, what, it's what one uh, commentator calls friendly fascism. They found a way 
to get us to surrender all everything that we've gained over all these years as, as human rights. They found a way for us to surrender it voluntarily in exchange for all the techno whiz gadgetry and good times. But the good times are going to come to an end. And I think when the good times come to an end, you're going to, you know, the velvet glove is going to come off of the iron fist. The but, iron fist you can see in other countries like, like Syria, but uh, a short prime minister deploring the violence in Syria. Well, yes, it's a difference in degree between the violence in Syria and the violence in Toronto, but the police charged the peaceful protesters in Toronto and beat them up and jailed them for days and humiliated them and threatened women with rape, and our prime minister wasn't bothered by that at all. Yep, yep, absolutely. Again, it's almost like inflation. It's, it's hidden to a degree. It's hidden from from the, the public at large. The public at large just watching their TV shows and drinking beer, and as long as they're comfortable, they're never going to do anything. Never question. Never and when, question. They're, when, they, when, the young, when the comfort stops, it'll probably be too late to do anything because they'll declare martial law. And you'll see the same process that Nazi Germany went through before World War Two. Well, it's, it's it's done in your own interest at that stage. And that's actually a good point in Germany because I think it was in Holland where um, before before uh, Hitler invaded, they used to take the different the different countries and the different nationalities. They used to take all the statistics about where they're located in that in terms of burial afterwards. After Hitler got access to this information, he was fit to straight away know where all the Jews was located. Point being that the information today may be in the hands of Google or maybe in the hands of Facebook and maybe some people do trust these as corporations and companies. But who's to say 10, 15, 20 years from now where that information could ultimately end up? Yes. And then, and, and nowadays, I, I think in the past, oppressive regimes tried to shut people up. Yes. And nowadays we're encouraged to speak because by speaking we prove that there's freedom of speech, therefore there must be democracy. Yes. Whereas there isn't. Freedom of speech doesn't matter to them. Say whatever you like, think whatever you like. As long as you don't make any difference, what, is, what do they care? Yep. Okay, Paul, I think that's a good, a good point to go for a break. Um, we'll be straight back where we're talking to Paul Grignon on Money as Debt and after the break we're also going to be discussing Paul's proposal and Money as Debt 3. You're listening to the Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. We are Irish side of the moon, freedom of information, personal empowerment. Welcome back to Irish side of the moon. You can check us out at Irish side of the moon dot blogspot dot com or you can go to uh, and I hate to say this after our last conversation there, Paul, Facebook dot com forward slash Irish side of the moon. On this week's show, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Grignon. Paul is the writer and producer of the classic Money as Debt trilogy. Check out his sites at www.moneyasdebt.net. That's moneyasdebt.net. And also www.digitalcoin.info. That's digitalcoin.info. Now, Paul, before the break, we were discussing, I suppose, the current system and some of the, the fallacies and the inherent faults that's in it. Um, and why it actually creates the boom bust cycles itself. Uh, it's very easy to criticise while contributing nothing to the debate. This is definitely not true in your case. You have worked earnestly over the last number of years putting forward an alternative system to the one that's currently in place. Can you give us an overview of what you're proposing? And we'll get into the details a bit more afterwards. Well, the simplest thing for people to do to understand the concept is to watch the little seven-and-a-half-minute movie, The Essence of Money, which is at the digitalcoin.info website. It also comes on the DVD with Money as that Three as the uh, beginning short because it pretty much summarizes what I'm proposing. And what I'm proposing is precisely what was done in medieval markets 500 years ago. It's nothing particularly new, but as I see the, the method used with today's technology could create a completely liberated money system where people create money, not governments, not banks. Now, in actual fact, while people would be free to create money, 
no one is required to accept your credit. So therefore, logically, it would still be governments and companies, corporations that produce things that people trust will still be there tomorrow that would create most of the money. But however, it would be liberated so that if you can get people to accept your credit, then your credit will be accepted and use this money. And okay. it yep, sounds yeah. complicated. Sounds very complicated, but if you understand, it's really just different. And if you, when you really understand it, it's a heck of a lot simpler than today's money system. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to try, I want to try to explain. Uh, we're obviously going to encourage the listeners um, to go to the websites and definitely, if possible, to purchase the the Money Is Death Three uh, video. And actually, you're actually getting two discs with that as well. So I mean, there's value for money there to be had. Um, but I want I want to try to give them some kind of explanation on the interview tonight. So sometimes I think it's it's to understand these things. If we can give a practical example, so if we say for example take you self issue and credit system and put it in a day to day environment. So say we have a small town and in the town we have like a farmer, a grocer, a doctor, a handyman, say even in electronics stores. Taking this simplistic scenario, can you talk us through the day to day use of your system? Well, if you have a company that produces something that's in demand, so we have a, pre- so we have a farmer producing, say, crops and and say, meat and milk and that for for the local grocery store. Well, you've got to have somebody who produces something that's in reliable demand. And in the in the model I propose, there are ways of automating the value of somebody's credit according to demand, simply by valuing the uh, doing the the, the 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 equation of the number of buy orders compared to the number of sell orders will revalue the credit in real time. Now that's getting into it a lot, but say if you're talking about a local money system, people tend to tend to see it as a local money system, and it could be used that way. Uh, that somebody who produces something simply issues a contract. What it is is a legally binding contract against themselves. I, if I promise you so much of my time or so much of my product, um, then when you deliver this contract back to me, I got to spend it at a, at a value, and you get to buy it, buy things from me at that value. And no banks and no governments are allowed are are involved. Okay, so, so say for example, say you're a farmer and you're producing a certain quantity of, say for example, milk, which is in big demand, and if you have a if you have enough cows or cattle, you can easily, say, um, equate for maybe a small town or a small village worth of, of milk moving forward. So that farmer issues a credit. Issues a credit, right. Okay, now we'll leave aside what value unit he uses to measure it. Because obviously if, you're, if somebody's doing milk and somebody's doing fish, what's the common value unit? So that that's the fundamental problem. Yes. But the basic problem that is, if once you've got a value unit, if, if the farmer... Um, producing the milk is promising you a certain amount of milk, and he issues this credit for milk, and it it can circulate as money. So I it's worth something. Like just just as if you had a piece of paper that promised you so much gold, why wouldn't the piece of paper that promised you so much milk also be money? Right? People understand that you can get a piece of paper that promises you so much gold, and they understand that that could be used as money. Well, why can't a promise of milk be used as money? Well, of course it can. In fact, it's better because nobody ever collects the gold, so that makes it possible to produce fraudulent promises of gold that doesn't exist, whereas the milk is going to be bought and consumed. If you can't produce a fraudulent promise of milk, you better have the milk to back it up. Otherwise, somebody's going to come to you with your legally binding contract, and if you don't have the milk to, be- to uh, deliver on it, you're in breach of contract. Absolutely, and so, you're out of business. Okay, so we have the farmer, and he's issuing he's issuing these credit notes. And for example, say I, I live in the town, and I get one of these credit notes, but maybe I don't need milk at the moment. Maybe maybe I have a sore back, and I decide to go to the doctor, or maybe I need a wee bit of work doing around the house, and maybe I need um, extra maybe shelves put up, for example. So I'll go to the handyman. So I, I, I'm. 
I'm assuming that with my credit for Mulk, I can pass that credit on to the handyman. And he, in turn, may or may not decide to draw down the mulk on it. Or he may pass it on. For example, as he's putting up shelves for me, he might hit his thumb with the hammer and he has to go to the doctor. He may take that credit that I passed on to him and take it to the doctor. Sure. Well, if it's backed by real value, then why not use it as money? Yes. And at some point... If it was a worldwide system, you could buy something from somebody in Japan. Yes. With your milk credit. <laughs> and, and then they would end up trading it for something else, and it end up, uh, eventually it has to come back to the, the milk producer f- to be redeemed. Because under my system, the, the, all credits only last a certain length of time before they, collect, they have to be collected on. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you would have infinite supply of money being produced, right? So it has to be collected upon within a certain length of time. And I figure everything is seasonal, so I made it. My suggestion is it be 14 months. It allows you an annual cycle plus two months grace period to, to uh, collect on your credits. Okay. And so in this scenario we pay, that we're highlighting here, that, that we're putting together, at some point someone's going to go back to the farmer with that token or that, that um, piece of paper of credit, and the farmer's going to have to pay that person in mulk. And that's just basically the way it will work. What... Yeah, no, no, let me let me just elaborate on that. So imagine Please. that that milk certificate had been used for a thousand transactions between the time the farmer issued it and the time that somebody goes to collect it from the the farmer, collect the milk. Well, imagine that if the farmer doesn't have the milk. Well, only the last person gets shafted because everybody else got their trade done, even though the milk certificate wasn't any good. They all made their trades, right? They all got what they paid for. Only the last guy gets screwed. Yes. And it doesn't bring down the banking system. It doesn't require deposit insurance. It doesn't require bailouts from the government. Just the last guy gets screwed. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, losses are going to happen in any system. And in, in my proposal, the losses are absorbed immediately. There's no debt laid upon future generations and all this ridiculous system we have now. I mean, Americans are indebted for... Hundred thousand dollars the minute they're born. Yes, which is crazy. I don't know if that's the exact figure, but it's it's an insane system that as soon as you're born, you're you're in debt. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's 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 lunacy. It, it really is. See, now with your selfish credit system, is there is there any chance that people? is going to be reluctant to take, say, for example, an our scenario where we've got a farmer, we've got a grocer, a doctor, a handyman. Is there any chance that the doctor may not decide to take that? Is, is people going to pick and choose the credits that they take? And would that some way not make the system less efficient or make the system more prone to not functioning? Well, you're talking about the doctor and the farmer and the local guys, okay? So change that conception to uh, Toyota and General Motors and the British government and the Irish government and your town government that collects taxes, okay? Yes. Now, everybody's going to trust that those guys are going to be there tomorrow and that they have no interest in going out of business. <laughs> yes. right? They want to stay in business. So, therefore, they're, they're far more trustable than individuals. Now, we already have that kind of money, and it's in existence in very quite a few business-to-business barter networks that already exist. Yep. And business-to-business business, business barter networks are already using this money system where they, they produce credits backed by their own product. But they only exchange it between member businesses, allow them to spend that money into existence um, as credit towards their products, and everybody got to use it as money. Voila, you've got the system I'm proposing. Okay. It's so close to being in existence already, and I think it will come into existence when the government and bank money collapses. There's no other choice, really. Uh, either we, We'll either go back to the primitive gold and silver system where most of us don't have any gold or silver, so we're, we're stuck. Uh, I used, like to use the example, at, so if you go to a village market, or you, farmer's market, we have farmer's markets right here. So Imagine you show up at a farmer's market, and there's all this stuff to buy. Everybody's got stuff they produce, but nobody's got any money. So yeah. what do you do? Give up and go home? Okay. Well, nobody's going to give up and go home. They're going to say, well, we have to barter. Well, you know, to arrange the kind of trades where I want this, but they want that, and the other person wants this and that and the other thing, you could spend all morning making one lousy trade. Yes. 
and but in my example of the the, the absence of money, Anton simply produces credits for bread that he knows he could sell if there was if people had money. He knows how much bread he'd sell, so he just issues the credit against the bread, and everybody uses the money. Problem solved. I suppose, I suppose what, I, what I was trying to get at and what, what I was suggesting, not so much that people wouldn't trust that the farmer would be able to supply the milk, but if that person didn't have a need for that, that, that token or that credit, is he less likely to accept it? Say, for example, me going to the doctor with a certain number of tokens for milk and he already has ample milk. Uh, is he less likely to accept that? Or another scenario, say, for example... You work for the farmer. Um, the farmer's employing maybe two or three people to help him out on the farm. How does he does he pay them with all milk tokens, or how how do you get a mix into the system if, if if you're being employed? Well, in that case, well, okay. So so let's let's not imagine he's a farmer. Let's imagine he's a dairy corporation that sells yes. you know ten million dollars to ten whatever you want to use ten million euros of of milk a, a year. So yeah, he pays his employees with these certificates. Now, say we've got a new value unit, and it's not linked to the pound or anything. This is another issue we need. We need a value unit that doesn't go down with the rest of the national currencies. It's a fundamental problem. But okay, so his credits are just measured in this value unit, like you do now with euros or pounds. So you accept it as long as you believe that that company there is a demand. It doesn't have to be something that you want. Right? You, you don't have to want milk to accept a milk voucher because you know other people want milk. Okay. So therefore, you can spend it. It has yeah. a value defined by the price of milk. Okay, so the doctor knows that he can take that milk, and our scenario can take that milk token and give it on to someone else who will only be too willing to take it and at some point redeem it for milk. Yes, eventually somebody, if, if the milk producer produces so many liters of milk and sells them all each year, then it's pretty darn reliable that if he issues credit against that milk, somebody is going to want it at Absolutely. some point. Absolutely. So you can trade it a million times through all kinds of transactions that have nothing to do with milk and could be people who hate milk. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'd accept milk tokens and I don't drink milk. I don't even I hardly consume dairy products at all. Yep. I don't even think they're good things to eat. But nonetheless, I know that the milk producer has a has a has a demand for his milk, and therefore his credit's reliable. I can use it as money. I should be able to use it as money. It's far more reliable a promise of value than anything the government issues. And a yes. bank doesn't want to issue anything. A bank issues money as a debt as a promise to pay it back in money. So all, all a bank credit is is a promise to pay back the money that didn't exist in the first place with money that doesn't exist. Yep, good point. The sanity of it is pretty, it's pretty absurd. I, I had a little, you, you, you saw it in The Money is at Three with the Cheshire Cat hanging upside down out of the tree. And he, and so the banker says, if I owe you what you owe me, then you have money that you owe me. Yes. <laughs> that's, the, that's how the banking system works. Yeah. Yeah, you really go to someone else to issue your own credit for you. It's that is lunacy. Okay, well, well essentially that is what you do. You th that go is to what the you're bank, doing. Yeah, nobody will accept your credit, but they'll accept the bank's credit because it's the bank. But really, what you're issuing is your own credit right now. When you go and sign that promise to pay the bank, you are issuing your own credit. If you didn't issue your own credit, the bank would have nothing to lend. I, th I think part of, and you touched it on very early on in the interview, is money's a commodity. People don't actually realize that, that money isn't the actual value itself. It represents the value, and the value is the goods and services that people produce. And when you go to the bank and issue your own, or well, we're talking about issuing your own credit, the credit is when well, you go out and do your paintings or, or I go and do my day-to-day -day job, that's the actual value in itself. It's not in a piece of paper or even a piece of gold. That's right. You have to, you're going to have to go out and presumably, you know, you're like most of us, you're going to go out and produce real value in society in order to get earn money to pay the bank back in money. Well, the difference here in the system I'm proposing is that credit is never produced as a promise to pay it back in money. Credit is only produced as a promise to pay in real goods and services. That way, you're never going to not be able to pay back your credit due to a shortage of money. In this system, we can create artificial shortages of money anytime we want. The banks can do it anytime they want by just restricting lending. 
now there's not enough money for everybody to pay back their loans, and people are going to lose their collateral uh, inevitably and through no fault of their own. Not only that, but the money the bank is lending has never existed. Like you have a promise of legal tender that doesn't exist. I mean, there's only 3% of the legal tender that's promised that actually exists. So yes. all of them are fraudulent. And, and on top of that, when you go and sign a loan to a bank and you pledge as collateral something that you don't own and the bank doesn't own, you've committed an act of fraud. Every, every bank loan is an act of fraud. And it's on the fraud on the part of the borrower because you promise collateral you don't own. Yeah, uh, that's actually a good point. Was it, was it not a case in America back in the 50s or the 60s where um, a bank had brought someone to court to try to repossess their house? And the person argued the case that, well, for a contract to be legal, that both people have to bring something to the table. And in the case of the bank, they brought something that they didn't actually have, i.e. money. And as far as I know, the actual judge refused to let the bank actually repossess the house. Yeah, and then a few weeks later, the judge was killed in a mysterious accident. That's right. Well, he, <laughs> he said something like that. And they've never let a case like that go to a jury since. Yeah, it's... it's that was a jury trial in a, in a, in a common law court. Um, all of these things with banks get tried in admiralty court in front of a judge with no jury. And, and they, never get, they don't usually even get heard. Of course, the case is dismissed because banks are allowed to do this and you are not. What banks do would get you thrown in jail. Absolutely. Okay, so let's assume for argument's sake that your system is adopted around the planet. How would the system be ruled out and integrated with the current system? For example, what would happen with people's savings, their pensions, people's long-term financial investments, let alone what would happen, say, in the financial markets with the likes of derivatives and currency trading and hedge funds? And I suppose also what would happen with government debt, etc. Um, having spoken with Bernard Latar, uh, I suppose within the last maybe nine months, he was one of the architects for the conversion mechanism for the euro. And I mean, he stated himself like the process was complicated and went on for, for many years. So can you explain a little as to how this adoption will take place? Well, this adoption wouldn't work the same as trying to uh, bring in the euro by any means because uh, I've met Bernard Lee. I actually stayed at his place overnight. 2009, and he, he's read Digital Coin, and he, he thought it was a good idea, but I'm, he, he didn't want to endorse it. So, because it, it seems like too much of a pie in the sky, um, futuristic kind of idea. But personally, I just see it as self defense, and no, it doesn't integrate with the current system. It, it integrates it only in the proposal to uh, take the money that you have in the current system and buy the credits, buy some credits in the new system. However, uh, yeah, it's basically predicated on self-defense in that if the current system completely collapses in chaos, which <laughs> I think is the only thing it's ultimately capable of doing, um, what are you going to do? You're going to be standing there. Uh, we still produce all the same things, but the money system has become completely dysfunctional. So what do we do? Uh, I don't see, as I put it in the movie, I don't see any solution other than debt forgiveness um, starting all over. There's no way out of this current system. Money is debt, and you can't you can't pay off your debt because money is debt. I mean, the, the absurdity of where the corner we've been painted into cannot be uh, resolved using this system. Yeah, we we cannot have money today without having. Well, we we can in some ways because um, central banks, like I suppose the um, the the Fed in America, um, they they can issue. I think you alluded to earlier on to uh, the reckon today between ninety to ninety seven percent of money is created within the banking system, which leaves three to seven percent that's um what we call hard currency notes and coins yeah and the, but all of that only coins are not debt, yeah, even the paper the, the, is actually debt it's yeah that, that's paid. right yep that's that's right yeah only the coins is is um debt free um so is that not going to is that not going to be extremely hard, Paul, to get people to adopt? Say, for example, now, I might not believe in the system in place at the moment, but on paper or on a computer screen, I may have, for argument's sake, 50,000 euros of savings. From what you're saying, there's no direct conversion available to go from the current system into your 
into it, the system you're proposing. So that means people giving up a lot of what they have, if not in reality of what they have on a computer screen, which to a degree still functions in reality because if I have 50,000 or if I have a computer screen and a bank saying I have 50,000 euros on it, by and large I can take that and I can get real goods and services from the economy today. Yes, and that might be a good idea before the money becomes worthless. So, so you just yeah. don't know what to buy. Well, well this, hey, is, this is the thing. You don't know what to buy that's going to be valuable in the future and that won't spoil in the meantime. Well, I suppose... I don't have any magic answers to this one, Shane. I, I basically created the new Money is Debt Tree as a vision of how things could be different. In, in much the way I, it's less dreamy than the Zeitgeist movement, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely a completely different idea. And... Uh, I see w roles for the banking-type people in it. As you, you probably saw, there's all these brokerages and partnership yeah. exchanges. There's definitely ways that the financial sector-type people would find gainful employment in my system, but it's not, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not directly compatible with the current system at all. So I suppose... Well, what it's more of a response to the, the collapse of the current system. What would we do? I, it's like I said earlier, if, if everybody comes to the farmer's market and they've got real stuff to trade, but the money system has become completely dysfunctional, what do you do? Yeah. You don't have any gold. You don't have any silver. You don't want to go back to those systems. The government money is inflating so that tomorrow's money is worth a quarter of what today is worth today. You know, hyperinflation. What do you do? Okay. Well... I've I've looked at the Money is Debt video. I've probably watched it now. I'm not exaggerating five six times since since I've got it, and I'm really enthralled by it, and I'm excited by it, and I'm very interested in it. I'm somewhat disheartened in the sense, speaking with you now, that I think it deserves more. It deserves more coverage than what it's going to get when people realize that there's no way to bridge the, the chasm between what we currently have and what we don't have. You could argue at some at some point in the future the current system is going to come down like a ton of bricks. It, it, it may, and at the same time, it may not because we've had like the Great Recession back in the 1930s. We've had what happened in 2008. And to some degree, people will take losses. Uh, it's normally the poorest in society that will take the hat forward, but at some point the system, the boom bus cycle, it goes through the bus part and the, the cycle begins over again. I think for, for people to, to I, I'm struggling with the fact that you've come up with such a great idea, but the only thing that's really lacking here and which could really blow it out of the pond completely is the fact that how do we get that conversion? How do we bridge the chasm? It has to be something you've obviously, you must have tried to give serious thought to. Well, in one, uh, one version of the transition, you could, trick, you, could, we, you could buy what I call perpetual coin with your current bank credit. And the idea was that if you buy these new units, uh, they're basically uh, digital trading units, something like this Bitcoin, but... It's a different conception. I mean, okay. Bitcoin is a speculative. You've heard of Bitcoin? Uh, I have come across it, yet. yeah. Yeah, well, well it, it doesn't have a fixed value. I'm proposing that we create a new value unit that has is defined by formula, and I call it the escape route, because you can create a mathematical formula based on today's currencies that would produce a new value unit that would be very resistant to inflation. And that would be a smooth curve. While all the other ones are jumping around in, in their variations against each other, it would be both a predictable smooth curve and it would tend to keep its value relative to real goods and services. And we would use this formula to define the value. It wouldn't be up to speculators in the foreign exchange market. It would be defined by formula. And I call it the escape route. And you could take your bank credit and buy these new units, and then we put the bank credit back into the bank you drew it on, so that the bank isn't the bank is protected, the banking system isn't disturbed by this, and we can then proceed to do business in these new in this new currency. But ultimately, the new currency has to be credit for real things, not for 
a bank credit that you deposited in the bank. Of course. And and to do that, uh, it's just different. I, it's not the same thing. You could translate from the current system if you were to take your the money you have saved up and invested in a productive uh, into productive capital, right, or into a, a, a equity investment that produced something, and then that equity investment business would issue its credit in the new system, and that way you would end up you would have a, a, a path from one to the other. But to take bank credit, which is a promise of money that doesn't turn it into our new system, is they're two different things. Okay. I mean, one's, one's based entirely on promises of real things from a specific person, and the other is on a promise of paying back money that doesn't even exist. Yeah, I, I, and I'm with you and I agree with you wholeheartedly. I just feel that to get, you know, to get, to get the population at large on board with something as radical as this, we have to try to bring bring them with us. And no matter how good, no matter how good the system is afterwards, it's going to be very hard to get people to give up what they currently think they have. And that's. But one thing I'm interested, you're on about get, getting some kind of value for it. Now, um, have you come across Doctor Bob Blaine's idea regarding our money, our, our H O U R as in as in time. I mean, his argument in brief is that like time and weight and distance, etc., needs to conform to some degree to a universal measurement system. He argues that any product or service is measurable in time, be it man hours put in to develop and produce a product or service, or even the materials themselves in terms of, you know, the time it takes, for example, um, wood or, or oil or whatever to develop over a period of time. Um, now, one, he comes up with his formula or his calculations is that you, if you take the GDP of a country and divide that by the man hours required to produce it, um, that you arrive at a basic value of measurement. Now, the value would go from, for example, um, time, which is measured in, in units of 60, um, to units of 100, which is measured in money. Now, what I really like about that idea is the fact that it gives value to goods and services that truly reflect the cost of production. Um, so, for example, if you look at things like cars and things like houses, which can take maybe months, and in the case of houses, maybe decades to pay off, these things could be paid off in maybe years, um, or would be paid off in years, and in the case of cars, possibly even months. Have you looked at at that as an idea, or as a concept, or have you even come across Dr. Bob Blaine? I haven't specifically looked at that one, but I'm certainly familiar with the idea of using time as a unit, time of, and labor. The, the problem I have with that is, you know, I, I spent most of my life as an artist, and it doesn't matter how much time and labor I put into a painting. It's irrelevant to the value, absolutely irrelevant. I, I have sold paintings for $5,000 that I spent only a couple of days on, and I'm still hanging on to paintings that I spent mon a month on. It's only if you want it. You see, value is entirely in the perception of the buyer. It's, there's no there's no inherent value to anything. So well, that's why I have I have a problem with those concepts. And in the in the money is debt three, I'm just going out to propose that we there's never going to be a value unit that you can hang anything on. And even when it was gold and silver, the, uh, there was always a carry trade between India and Europe because uh, in Europe they valued silver more highly and in, in India they valued gold more highly. So you could move gold from Europe to, sil to India and make a profit and you could move silver from India back to Europe and make a profit. Yeah, right? well Exactly. So I guess what you're saying, the problem's twofold. The problem is, in one sense, that I agree with you in terms of, of if you look at the money systems in place or, or the our money systems in place today, for example, say I'm a plumber and, and say you're a painter, I exchange an hour of my time for an hour of your time and I agree that that may work well on a very small scale. I think what he's suggesting is a lot more, I suppose, complicated and complex than that. It's part of the problem not to do with the lack of resources, that we have a finite amount of resources and that in some ways that that limits, that that limits the system, that, that there's a bottleneck there in the system. Um, because if you look at money in the traditional sense, 
know, if you look at the traditional e- economists and and and, and um, what what the actual money system teaches, it teaches scarcity is where money derives its value from. So when you're talking about silver or, or say talking about gold, silver is a lot more used within manufacturing, and it's probably more plentiful than gold. But at the same time, there's a lot more use for it. So when something's in short the pl- short supply, that the value of it goes up. Yes, ultimately, although the silver market has been tremendously manipulated for the last several years. But but that only is that is that not fair, Paul, to say that that really only applies to certain commodities? Say, for example, your painting. You don't necessarily need to get five thousand dollars for a painting. You need to be able to afford to live in society today. And is that not part of the problem that we have this ludicrous system where? If, if we both agree that the cost, that the value of money is not in the actual coins or the notes, but it's in the production, we have shelves full of items today that we could obviously afford to produce in the first place, but we can't afford to actually buy afterwards. And that while commodities may be limited and, and scarce to a certain degree, that some things like maybe painting and stuff like that, if you can make a living that you can buy pretty much anything you need to in society today, be it obviously groceries and stuff like that, but be it luxuries as well, things like maybe TVs, computers, a holiday a couple of times a year, um, that you don't necessarily need to be making massive, you know, you don't need to be valuing a painting, of, for example, 5000 or 10000 and stuff like that. Well, in my case, you know, I've been living at about a third of the uh, average income for my whole life. So yes, and I've managed to got a paid-up house, uh, two two houses that we actually have, and a and a studio, and all this stuff. And I've done it on a third of the income that people, most people, can't even afford a house of, at their normal income. And I've yeah. done it all on a third or or you know of the average income, and it's just the way you know we were lucky we got here before the building code, so I could do that. But um, yeah, the the, the 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 paintings I sold at high prices were uh, what finance money is at three. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is that the the value is not in the time that I spent on it. It is in the quality of what I produce and the appeal it had to the person who bought it. Yes. Right? And the time I spent on it and the materials involved, which are worth about ten or fifteen dollars. <laughs> are absolutely irrelevant. Now, that okay. doesn't apply to, say, producing a can of baked beans. Which but is... to some extent, you could produce anything. If there's no demand for it, it has no value. It doesn't matter how many hours you put into it. Ab- absolutely. I suppose maybe that gets into Bernard Latar and what he's, you know, what he's putting forward in terms of there's no one solution to the money system per se. And I guess you do touch on this too with Money is Debt 3, that it's almost like an ecosystem that there'll be a lot, a lot of different currencies floating about there. I mean, with Dr. Bob Blaine's idea, things like, say, for example, your your groceries, your your bread and butter, um, your can of baked beans, instead of costing, I don't know what the cost is in America, but for, say, for example, a carton of milk here in Ireland, you'll be paying maybe one euro, one euro fifty, where you'll be getting it for cents as opposed to, you know, dollars. Um, and that maybe that's what we need. We need... Vi- biodiversity in the sense that the solution maybe isn't one, it's a whole lot of different currencies. Well, yes, Bernard definitely believes that we should have a, 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 a relocalization or a devolution into um, individual currencies, local currencies, different kinds of currencies on different bases, things that would compete with each other, things that would allow us to exchange value without being hostage to the one banking system and government fiat money that we are required to use now. But all those things have the same problem of acceptance, right? People are yes. just conditioned, and they don't trust uh, these alternatives, whereas, whereas they trust this government money system. But, you know, the way the government money system is um, destroying itself People will, aren't are less trustworthy of it now, and and trying to find an alternative. Personally, I think it's going to break down to such a, a large extent that people are going to have to relocalize on everything: their, their food supplies, their water supplies, everything they need. They're going to have to go back to producing more of it locally because the international system of exchange is going to break down for many reasons. 
one of them being the energy shortage. You know, it, it only made sense when it was cheap to transport things across the world. If it's not cheap anymore, it's more rational to make them at home. Well, I think there's a book written in the, the late 90s. Um, I don't know if you've come across A Grip of Death. Yeah. Michael, yeah. I, I think he, he paints a picture, because, I mean, that to me is ludicrous as well. For example, in Ireland, we produce, I think, beef at the moment that can feed possibly up to 30 million people, and we have a population of 4.5 million. But yet we import beef then from the likes of Argentina or Brazil. To me, that doesn't make sense. Now, I think he puts forward the hypothesis that part of the, the way the international trading system works today is because of the debt-based money system. The co- countries have to try to become net exporters to try to get out of debt. Um, yeah, and everybody's trying to be a net exporter, which, which is, is an impossible. impossibility. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm part of that. So I agree with you. I mean, getting back more to locally and stuff like that there would seem to be the way to go for ma- for the planet as well. I mean, obviously, we're, we're destroying the planet. I think planet. we'll just be forced into it. I don't think we have to choose it. We'll eventually be forced into it. Yeah, agreed. Now, I want to if take we you up- it first, we would be in a much better position. Uh, absolutely. I want to take you up on, on something regarding Money is Death 3 and something, again, you alluded to there five or ten minutes ago. Um. One of my big gripes today is the whole, I suppose, in society in general, with the political and economical and educational system, which is indeed reflected in the heart of the money system as well. And that's the conditioning of individuals to compete at all costs, which in turn adds to creating greed and self-interest and, I suppose, if you will, the so-called selfish gene. Um, Now, if we live on a planet of finite resources and every day we waste them at a, a criminal amount, um, and search for power and control. Big businesses, big corporations are as guilty, and in some cases even more so than the political and monetary system. Now, initially on Money is Debt 3, you kind of, at the beginning of it, you kind of suggesting that, you know, small companies, individuals produce their own credit. But later on, you kind of get to the stage where you're saying that a lot of this credit is being produced by, I suppose, people in, in control of commodities like maybe oil and, and and food and stuff like that there. How can we trust big corporations any more than we could trust, say, the, the banking cartel and and the political system? Well in the in the system I'm proposing, the uh, producers and issuers of credit have are dependent actually on that credit reaching their customers. So in that sense it's the opposite of what we currently have where the the rich want to get richer and richer in terms of money while actually impoverishing their customers. Well, how the heck are the customers going to buy the stuff they produce if they're impoverished? I mean, this is the opposite of what Henry Ford figured out. Henry Ford paid his workers three times the going wage so that they could buy the cars they were building. That's the principle on which a successful economy is built, not on... Uh, turning the people into peasants. I, I, I use, I, I have written an article in which I basically think the historical process was that back in the feudal system, uh, the lords used to come and just take whatever surplus you had and they left you with enough to survive on so that they could take your surplus again next year, right? Yes. The tax collector just showed up. It's like the Robin Hood story. The tax collector just shows up, beats up everybody and takes all your extra food for the lords. Well, then the peasant says, well, what the heck? What's the point of producing a surplus if they're only going to take it from me? So okay. the, the peasants would only produce a little bit more than, than they needed because they knew they were going to be robbed of their excess. But this is, this is like uh, paying a high rate of income tax, for instance. So what the, what, the, what the rich and the feudal lords figured out is, oh, set the people free, get them to compete in a free free market economy and take your taxes through interest on loans and through taxes, especially income taxes. And this way people think that they're free, but actually before they lived in villages in which they were cooperative and their enemy was the Lord who taxed them. And now we turn each other into enemies and we, we just submit to this taxation and this interest without even thinking about it. And it was a great system because it turned us into very productive people, and the rich got much richer off of our surpluses now than they did back when they just stole it 
at gunpoint, basically, or sword point. Well, Following me, the, the idea that what, what we consider freedom is the freedom to make as much money as we want, and we're encouraged to do so in, in competition with each other, but there's a ceiling placed on it where income taxes are going to take it off of this, and in order to do so, we generally have to borrow money from the banks to capitalize our efforts, and the banks collect interest on that. And it's a great system for the for the the rich to to. Uh, it's much more um, productive. Much productive for them. It's much more productive for us. But there's no limiter there that recognizes environmental um, limitations. So as a system that that created prosperity and high levels of production and inventiveness is very successful. And it's been in place now for 500 years, it's been very successful. But since it didn't recognize any of the limits of the planet, we're now at those limits. And that system doesn't work anymore. The whole money system based on infinite growth is a great idea as long as infinite growth is, as growth is still possible. But when growth is not possible, you've got to have a different system. And the system I designed is designed to shrink just as well as to expand. Okay. I suppose one of the things I'll be concerned about, because, I mean, all this information is out there to big corporations as much as it is to, like, so me and you. And, for example, if you look at a corporation, say, like, like Apple, I mean, with, with the Apple, with the iPhone and the iPhone 4, they're using batteries that, that I believe they give about 400 to 450 cycles and that's what they'll last and a cycle is a full charge and a full discharge so they're deliberately putting components into and and we see it not only with apple but we see it with the quality of of tvs of cars of of washing machines where stuff is deliberately designed to last for a short period of time in which case the consumer has to go back and, and repurchase again um which is a feature of our system because there's no way of distributing wealth without people having wages for making stuff. Yes. And if we made stuff that lasted, uh, you know, 100 years or if we were uh, satisfied with a level of technology where we didn't have to have something even spiffier next month, um, things would, could be made to last much longer. But then people would be out of work. So how do we distribute the wealth to them if they don't have a job? It's a, it's a fundamental problem of the way we structured our economy on endlessly producing stuff, even if we don't need it. Exactly, and that, that's what I was actually coming to. That was a question because some proponents in the past have put forward some kind of maybe national income that if you look at the GDP of a country that you divide it out amongst its citizens. Um, because, I mean, another thing that we're coming to too is if you look at today, we're technologically more advanced than what, we, what we've ever been. We have a growing population, so you... Where 100 years ago or 60 years ago, you'd have had, say, an industry like the car industry, you'd have had a very manual in terms of labor. Today, we have big robots that assemble most of the cars. So that's the way industry is going today. We can replace humans with robots. And in some ways, it's actually a good thing because they're more efficient and we can do things using less resources, planetary resources. So we have this conundrum that we have more people and at some point in the future, we're going to have less jobs. Have you looked at that? Because obviously the money system has to play a part in this as well. I suppose, again, one of the suggestions in the past was that we have some kind of national income that people's paid, and that allows for productions of goods, but also allows for the actual purchase of the goods then. Well, that is one thing. Yeah, I'm well aware of that suggestion. Um, social credit, for instance. Yeah, we actually had credit. a social credit government elected in the province of Alberta back in the 30s. But they, did, they weren't able to implement social credit because of the pressure from the banking system. It, yeah, that was uh, an idea invented in Scotland by Major Douglas. Yes. The, uh, the, the way I deal with that in my proposal is that everything, every credit that has, is produced must get to the customer that uses it. And say in, the, in the, the chapter about technological displacement, I said that if a, if a company produced everything with robot labor and didn't need to employ any humans, they'd still have to give the money away. They'd have to give credits away to their their customers. Yep. Otherwise, yep. They, wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to sell anything. Of course, so yeah. So I think that, that that same principle would definitely um, distribute the money in the same sense of the general income. Of course. No. 
we're coming towards the end of, of the actual interview. There's a couple of things I want to touch on on quickly. Um, I suppose one, I want to try to be a wee bit critical of what, what, what you're proposing as well. And I suppose some of your critics will say that you don't understand finance and banking. And I know that, that um, say, for example, with money as debt, I know you respond on your site to some of the criticisms directly where people suggested that fractional that factionally you were wrong on, on some of the some of the material you presented, I think specifically towards maybe fractional reserve lending. And they'll argue too that maybe on, on the overall scale, um, how you address the question on banking and finance is a highly complicated field and that many great minds over, over the decades have dedicated their lives to this. And although while they may accept that the system isn't perfect, it's far from it, but they wouldn't suggest that, this is a, that it is a systemically flawed and morally and ethically corrupt as what you do in your videos. How would you address such criticism? Uh, okay, well, I had somebody who, who went through a number of economics books recently, and not a one of them mentioned how money was created as debt. Not one. The economists tend to not study the nature of money in the same way that doctors don't study nutrition. Okay, good analogy, so, good analogy yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a, this whole thing where the, the fundamental nature of money is ignored by the professionals who make those criticisms. So I've spent 12 years studying the money system strictly from the point of view that money is created as debt. What does that mean? And I have very few people who criticize me. I have, I've got, you can see my reviews page, economist I, I after economist and teachers of economics saying, oh, this is the best thing that's ever been produced to explain the money system. So I've had very, very little criticism. Have you ever considered... Criticism, uh, the first movie I had a part about the, how the fractional reserve system worked that was in error. And that's because I didn't know as much then as I know now. And I was listening to certain advisors who were wrong. And uh, one of the advisors confused me because what he told me about how banks would put... Banks would actually charge a loan customer cash for their loan, and then they deposit the cash at the central bank to give them the reserve that allows them to make the loan. And I put that in the movie, and while that, that, that makes a certain amount of sense, and my one uh, source, he went to court about this being done to certain clients. So it happened, but it's not legal. So I misrepresented it. But all of that is irrelevant now. We don't even have a fractional reserve system anymore. Yep. It's all moved on to the Bank of International Settlements capital adequacy. So the only thing that matters to a bank is does it have the capital adequacy? Does it have things it can reliably sell to cover its losses when you don't pay back your loan? Yes. Other than that, the bank will create as much money as you're willing to borrow. If you have collateral and you're a reliable borrower, they will create the money. It doesn't matter how much cash exists. The government the, the central bank will respond to any need for cash by creating more cash. But otherwise, who needs cash? I mean, if you do everything with your electronic uh, transfers and checks and transfers from bank account to bank account, who needs cash? Yep, good point. Well, I suppose that, and that would be a, an, another, I suppose, um, uh, I suppose, bone for contention as well is, for example, if you look at digital money per se, and if you look at, I suppose, credit card as one good example where you have a lot of credit card fraud not only on the credit cards themselves but also on the actual devices used to to accept your credit card be it a hole in the wall or be it maybe a credit card machine and a retail outlet um is digital money not more open to exploitation than say maybe some of the other forms of money and i'm thinking exact i'm thinking specifically about the more and more we're Everything's based online, everything's based on the internet, and all networks is linked together as well. I mean, we see the likes of big websites like, for example, the FBI and NASA and, and government websites that's been fit to be hacked into. Does that not some degree, is it not some, is it not some redundancy built into using notes and coins in the sense that if a computer tells you you have no money in your account, even though you know you have money, you can do nothing at all with it, but at least if you have notes or coins in your pocket, you can still purchase something. Yes, well, I haven't eliminated paper cash issued by the government from my proposal. Okay, yeah. So definitely part of the proposal. It, it, it's related to the government issuing its own credit, and therefore it's valued according to the government's credit. 
But uh, yes, there's still I still preserve a need for actual physical cash. The other thing about the digital money system is the one the the version I am proposing doesn't go through a central website. There's no website to hack. It's all peer to peer, and it uses a uh, an encryption process that. Supposedly, you know, I mean, yes, it remains to be proven, but uh, the whole thing was based on the idea that you could create files that were secure. Yes. And they're, but they're, 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 they're transferred directly, say, from me to you. They don't go through some central website that can be hacked. Well, I see. I, I guess the point, and I actually work in IT as well, I guess the point I'm coming from that even if you look at something like peer to peer, um, there's still a possible connection there that someone could hack into it. I mean, you've, you've had popular software, the likes of, for example, LimeWire and BearShare. I mean, in essence, they're peer-to-peer, that information is coming directly from one computer to another computer. That can be exploited. Um, you don't, necessar- you don't necessar- necessarily have to have a, a web interface to be hacked into. I mean, there's, there's, there's computer systems and banks and stuff like that that doesn't have a web interface, but yet they can still be... Uh, exploit it. Well, I've been working with this company in Scotland. They were the ones who um, sort of propelled me into making this first proposal. They said, if we could create a completely secure file, how would you produce a liberated money system? And that's how I came up with Digital Coin. Yes. Was on that premise. Now, a lot of people are unhappy with that because a strictly peer-to-peer system like that has no backup. So if, yes. you, if you fail, there's no worthy, there's no record keeper. Uh, so on the one hand, you want pe- people who want it to be anonymous and free of any banking system, and the other people, other side, uh, the people want some kind of backup. So technological implementation is still, of course, a problem. But okay. the the system that we were proposing is that each file is broken up into pieces. And they're stored in separate places in the cloud, and then each piece is encrypted by the, by a unique code created by created from the preceding or the following piece. Yeah. So the chances of breaking this encryption are pretty low, but of course it has to be proven in practice, and it hasn't been yet. Yeah. Well, no, I, 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 I would actually I would concur with you there in terms of the encryption. There is. I mean, there is some very sophisticated encryption going on today, and you have it in the likes of government agencies where you have maybe uh, government maybe laptops and stuff like that, and the files is encrypted to the degree that, as far as I'm aware of, there's no way that you can actually hack around them. Um, so from from that point of view, I would, I would agree with you there. I want to just wrap up now, um, Paul, and I suppose what I want to get out to, I mean, I always say to the moon, I mean, part of our two founding principles is freedom of information, and personal empowerment and the freedom of information comes about with speaking to people like yourself people that doesn't necessarily get mainstream attention um, the personal empowerment is slightly different I mean we believe that by giving people access to information that through their average day to day they wouldn't come across we provide them the opportunity to um, you know to make better informed decisions so with that being said I'd want to ask you what can people do today after listening to this interview that can make a difference to help and bring about real change in, the, in our monetary system? <laughs> well, that's an invitation to plug buying my movie. <laughs> <laughs> surely, surely not. <laughs> well, look, no, well, I'm, look, I'm just an artist who made a movie. I, I don't have the power to make things happen, but I do have the power to spread ideas. And money is debt is last time I searched Google, I just put in money is dead in quotation marks so that you get the exact phrase. I got 6,780,000 web pages that Google said supposedly. I don't even know what that means, but it's been translated and pirated in 21 languages. It's online in 24 languages I've found. Wow. And all I can do is say, let's spread some new ideas, you know, open our minds. I don't know how this is going to work out. Fundamentally, I think that if people understand what money is now, that it's really your own credit. You're self-issuing credit now. Yes. And I'm just looking for a different way of self-issuing credit, one that doesn't involve bank interest and doesn't require payment in money that may be manipulated so that there isn't enough money for you to pay it back. Yes. And so when I think that just spreading these ideas, I, I, I hardly imagine that my system will probably ever 
come into existence as proposed. But if I can get this idea across to as many people as possible, it will change their understanding of money and empower them to think in different ways. And I think that this will make people more capable of adapting to what I think are some pretty horrible events that are going to come on in the future. I mean, they've already begun. And that's my sort of minimum ambition, is that, is that it, at least we can open people's minds. And one way to do that is certainly show them my movies. And one way to support, that, support me in this effort is to buy them, because that's where my income comes from. And I imagine, judging by the number of people who have seen my movies, they probably only sell one DVD for every thousand people who watch the movie for free. I agree. It really is one of those classics. It's, I suppose it's up there maybe even ahead of the likes of the Money Masters people. It's a real genre, I mean, and, and the ahead of Pink Floyd. Sorry? For a while there, I mean, uh, uh, the, on the very date of that first uh, G8 conference after the money crash? Yes. On two, that was March 2008, I think. Google took down my, my movie in all languages. Wow. On the very day of that conference, which is quite a suspicious act, but before that, my Money is Dead had been off six months in the number one position. You just put Google Video and put in the word money, and you got Money is Dead. And then underneath it comes like a six or seven posts of Pink Floyd's music video, which is normally number one. Yes. And it's number one in ten. Wow. But before that, I'd spent six months on the top of the list. It must be actually quite a good feeling that, uh, that you've produced something that a lot of people, forgive the pun, finds value on. I mean, the fact that it's been translated, it's been pirated so many times, that must be quite a nice feeling. On the one hand, it is, but it's sure. <laughs> <laughs> you have accomplished something. And I'm still struggling to make a living myself. So yeah. on the other hand, uh, you know, it, people now expect it to be free. Yeah, I, I well. put 24,000 hours into this project so far. I, I agree with and, you. And... Uh, Certainly a long ways from even making the minimum wage. Uh, absolutely. When you go to buy your groceries in the shop, that nice feeling quickly disappears when you reach into your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try to hold on to it. says, wow, you know, look at that. I did this, and then it's, people have gotten so much value out of it. Uh, yeah, it is a bit tough when I can't pay my own bills. <laughs> I'm not a financial whiz, and I'm not a big investor, and I'm not a rich guy. I'm just your struggling artist, uh, pretty much a classic type old-fashioned hippie, and I, I only really relate to working and getting paid for my work. That's what people should do. They produce stuff of value, and they get value back in return. Absolutely. One very That's final... That's what my money on. <laughs> <laughs> one very final question. Yeah. It's just kind of really, I suppose, following on from the last one. Um, I suppose many people in their lives would, w would want to make changes, uh, sometimes small changes, um, is there anything you can suggest in your own life? I mean, what have you used as your own motiv motivation, your own driving force? A lot of people have passive interests in different things, maybe like the money system or maybe um, losing a bit of weight, et cetera, et cetera. Can you, what have you used yourself to change you from someone who has a passive interest in something to becoming an action taker? Well, for a long time, I was more or less an environmental activist, and then I started to study um, economics, and then I started to realize that the money system itself only works with growth. So if we want to reach a stable economy and a stable population and a sustainable world, we can't use this money system. It doesn't work. And so you've got to get passionate. I mean, people are kind of dull down. And for a lot of reasons, some people just give up. Some people have never been interested. Most people have never really given money any thought at all. It's like fish in water. They don't think about the water. Um, you don't think about the air you breathe. But all of the stuff is being taken from us. You know, we're being robbed blind and herded into a world, a one-world government total dictatorship. And if you don't stand up and do something about it, that's where you're going to end up. If, if, you, if you're happy with that, that's fine. Most people are happy with it as long as, you know, the football's on TV and you can get some beer. Who cares? Absolutely. But 
That prosperity is probably, almost certainly coming to an end, right? I mean, Ireland's already suffered a, a huge blow. Um, that, that, that several decades of prosperity we've enjoyed since World War II is, is uh, coming to an end, and people are going to start getting angry and violent. And if they don't have an idea of what to do, that's going to be pointless violence, whereas if you have an idea, you can direct your anger and energies into um, productive purposes. And that's, uh, that's basically what I'm trying to do. I, the Money of Debt 3 produce is, a, is a vision of how things could be different, and I've done it in enough detail that you don't have to call it a, it's not a pie-in-the-sky dream. It's pretty detailed, and you would have to prove to me why stuff don't, doesn't work, because I thought this through in a great deal of detail. And it works, and it works nicely, and it would be a hell of a lot better for human beings if we work this way than the way we work now. Okay. Okay. It's well, the whole system on mortgages. If people just read the chapter on mortgages and how mortgages would work, uh, absolutely, it would, it would well, transform the world. Well, one very final question, broken into two parts, just something that 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 you've said there. What next for you now, Paul? I mean, you said. I know you've said on your website and that that you know this is the final installment of Money is Debt Three. So, by that, I'm going to take you at face value. There's not going to be a Money is Debt Four or some alternative to that. So, so what next now? I mean, where do you go from here? Well, I've been trying to organize a working group to uh, to actually make this Money is Debt Three proposal uh, into a, a working model. Yes, that's one of the things I'm working on. Um, and that's after that, I I have. Possibly some work uh, turning my movie into translated version. Um, there's there's some various economic topics I'd like to illuminate. Um, I'm been just reading an essay that quite uh, intrigues me about all the monetary fallacies that we that we largely believe in. Government make work projects and various things that people seem to accept as truisms when when they're they're quite false. So, but I haven't decided on what the next project is. Well, and part two of the very final, final question is, have you gone out and chatted to economists? Have you gone out and chatted to politicians and stuff like that? And if so, what kind of response are you getting from them? I would, I would hope, and I could be wrong, I'd hope that it just doesn't end here. You've put forward a solution that if you could somehow afford to, that you could, you know, persevere and maybe try to get this to see the, the light of day? Well, the problem there is that I'm just some guy with very little money living on an isolated island, and who's going to listen to me? And I I don't know if it's because it's a cartoon, but I don't get any invitations to go and present things. Wow. Um, you know, I have, I have yet to have a paid offer of a speaking engagement. Everybody asks me to do things for free, always for free. Okay. Oh, we don't have any money. Well, okay. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any money. Well, here's why. And uh, I've done all this work, but it doesn't pay me. And I'm not going to go out and punk myself, pay $20,000 to go out and promote my own ideas. I can't. I mean, I, at this point, I'm almost so discouraged. I feel like withdrawing and uh, just trying to look after my own survival. Okay, well, I would hope that this interview tonight would maybe motivate and, and highlight to people the actual Trojan work that you've done with your your Money is Debt trilogy. As I think you said there, 24,000 hours put into it. Um, you've read it, you've produced it, you've directed it. As far as I know, you've animated it as well. All, all by well, I yourself. did everything except do the do the voiceover. Yeah. Just, just, it's just say, I, I use the word created because I did everything. The music, the script, the research, the animation, all the drawings. Absolutely everything, except for I didn't do my own voice because I don't like my own voice. And, and mm. I have a neighbor who has a wonderful voice. I was actually just, it's funny you say, I was just chatting to a mate not that long ago, and we were, I was just actually commenting on that. Sometimes some things just work. I don't know why. In your case, you've got a great title, you've got a fantastic beat to Money as Death 1 and 2, and you've got this fantastic voiceover as well. It just seems as if it was written in the stars. All of these things just happen to come together. Yeah, well, my voiceover man, Bob Boston, is a, a formerly a famous folk singer in Canada. And he writes 
politically relevant songs that have a lot of lyrics. He has a great voice. He's uh, He did take the training in the CBC, our Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, to be an announcer, but never got a job. Um, yeah, and then he has the perfect kind of grandfatherly, friendly voice with a little bit of authority that works so beautifully. And he just lives down the hill, and he walks up here with his dog, and we do little, we record parts of the narration, you know, 20 minutes at a time or an hour at a time, whatever he's up for. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, I do stuff for him, and he does stuff for me, and we don't do any money trades. We don't keep any track of how much it's worth. It's all just gifting, basically. Wow. Gifting economy. I suppose it's it's a it's a tribute to the actual the whole essence of 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 money and I suppose your effort you put into this here. I mean it's 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 actually a nice story to close on. Uh, Paul Grignon, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you again. I really do hope that in terms of this will highlight to people the work and the effort that you put in. And I think myself personally, it would be a great shame if it's somehow you can't further this now. You've done a lot of the hard work. You've done a lot of the heavy lifting and and the studying you've put in over the years and coming up with the concept it would be a shame for the concept not to get any further now through lack of um, lack of interest from, from people I would definitely plug the websites once again um, we have www.moneyasdebt.net and we also have www.digitalcoin.info Paul it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for your time well, thank you for all the great questions, Shane. This is a good interview. I really appreciate what you, uh, the questions you asked and the intelligence you brought to it as well. Well, thank you, Paul. And that's it, folks, for this week's show. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an education chatting to Mr. Paul Grignon. Um, again, please check out his sites at moneyasdebt.net or digitalcoin.info. There at the moneyisdebt.net, you can also actually purchase the final installment, Money is Debt 3. It really, really would make um, uh, a great educational tool. Uh, very, very good value for money comes with two DVDs. Um, for ourselves, I would say to the moon, you can get us again at I would say to the moon.blogspot.com, where you get a back catalogue of all our shows. And also, if you're on Facebook, I would say to the moon.facebook.com. For myself, uh, Shane, from the rest of the team, Michael and Gabriel, good night. <laughs> We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. This is just a ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love. Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.